mailing. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Eric Crampton is the Chief Economist at the New Zealand Initiative, and he's researched and written numerous articles about tobacco control and how rhetoric has advanced beyond evidence. Let's see what he has to say about the economics and policy settings regarding tobacco control in New Zealand. Dr. Eric Crampton, welcome to The Crunch for the first time. Great to be here. Now, Eric, I've been doing a bit of a deep dive into tobacco policy. I got a bit of a personal interest in that because actually tobacco helped me heal from a stroke via nicotine. Um, And I've seen the attacks on the minister by various different public health uh, advocates, let's use advocates as a word, uh, that also seem to smear or try and connect the minister with a a particular tobacco company. And, And I was looking at the whole issue there and the screaming and the the gnashing of teeth and 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 all yep. the rest of it, and I'm sitting there thinking, some of this doesn't add up based on my experience. So I thought, well, let's get someone who's got down into the weeds on the numbers. Uh, let's get an e- a subject matter expert in in the economics of tobacco control and health outcomes, and let's have a discussion around that and see if we can't find what it is that that I seem to be missing. I can't get a public health advocate to come on the show to talk about it. They're paid by the public. You would think they would talk about their research, but no, they don't want to show their working and they don't want to show their homework. And that always raises red flags for me. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Let's start initially with with the furore over heated tobacco products and the supposed tax cut that's been delivered to Philip Morris and benefited their bottom line, which is the strap lines they were using. Okay, sure. That's a fun one. So at least, in, I guess to start addressing that one, we need to think about why tobacco excise is there in the first place. So mm. the normal arguments around it are on two grounds. One, that smokers cost the health system a lot of money and so should be contributing to the, a fund, basically, to, to cover the cost that they impose on everybody else who doesn't smoke. And two, that even if there weren't effects through the public health system costing other people money, that smoking is a bad thing, nicotine dependence is a bad thing, and that excise might be used to discourage people from doing things that hurt themselves. All right. Now we can argue about either of those premises, but let's take them as given for now and say that that is an ethical framework and we'll just work within that for now. Within that framework, you would want, I would think, to have higher excise rates on products that are more harmful and lower excise rates on products that are less harmful. So basically a graduated taxation system. There should be no tax on water, for example, right? Because water is good. That's right. Uh, And there's a a fun corollary in uh, the alcohol excise literature. So one of my favorite footnotes in a report on this stuff was from the um, review on Australian taxation overall, and they'd argued for a tax-free threshold on alcohol, where if you, I think it was around the first 1.6% of alcohol per volume, they said that if you drank uh, liters and liters and liters of of liquid that had 1.6% alcohol in it, you'd die of water poisoning before you died of alcohol poisoning. So that that is just a bit of fun uh, as a justification for a tax-free threshold. But that's kind of beside the point. Uh, If you take the premise that you should tax at a higher rate things that are more harmful and at a lower rate things that are sorry. If you take as a premise that the point of tax is to address the fiscal externality and to save people from themselves and from hurting themselves, then you would want to have a lower excise rate on things that are less harmful, both to yourself and with downstream consequences for that public health system, and a higher excise rate on the things that are more harmful. For a long time, Smoking was mainly cigars and cigarettes, and they have had a lower excise rate on cigars than on cigarettes. So 
slightly lower. It's something on the order of $1,600 per kilo for cigarettes and about $1,200 per kilo when it's in cigars and cigarillos. I'd have to double check the numbers, but those are the numbers in my head. It's around there. Yep. Um, and tech changed. So heated tobacco sticks started coming in. Those heat the tobacco rather than combusting it. Basically, all of the harms from smoking come from combustion. All right. Mm -hmm. So you're burning a pile of stuff. You're inhaling the smoke. Smoke isn't good for you. And that leads to the bad health consequences that we see from it. Heating tobacco to vaporize the nicotine in it, as well as some flavoring, fundamentally different. You don't get the byproducts of combustion when you don't have combustion. So they've had series of studies on this. People argue about potential differences in effects from ones that are tobacco funded versus not, but it seems pretty conclusive that like you, you run a, like they have these puff machines, so you put a cigarette on the end of it and it sucks through it and then you've got to filter it. And there's way less bad stuff on the filters from uh, heated tobacco as compared to combusted tobacco. So, which is what you would expect since you're not combusting and it's those bad things that lead to the harms down the track. So you should want to have a lower excise rate on heated tobacco as compared to combusted tobacco. How much lower? It depends how much less harmful you think it is. It's probably on the order of like maybe 10% as uh, harmful as a cigarette to maybe 40%. It's somewhere in there. I don't know that the, you would want to go to the experts on that, yep. but it's substantially less harmful than a combusted cigarette and probably more harmful than vaping. So you'd want to have an excise rate that reflected that. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's being excised as though it were a cigarillo kind of cigar comparable, right. which seems to be a mistake. The public health advocates have gotten fairly upset about this, framing it as a tax cut. Now, in that view, I guess you'd have to really weigh dependence itself as being a massive harm. So... If the thing that you cared most in the world about was people being dependent on nicotine on a regular basis and you didn't care as much about lung cancer and dying from smoking and emphysema later on, then you might want to ma maintain kind of prohibitionist style pro policies against anything that has nicotine in it, which is a bit weird because we're still keeping um, excise free vape, which I think is appropriate where uh, it's so much less harmful than uh, smoked tobacco. Uh, so there's a bit of an inconsistency there. I think that they get upset about it because tobacco is still in it and it's more clearly, um, well, it's, it's obviously manufactured by a tobacco company. And I mm -hmm. guess in terms of disclosures, like we're, we're a membership organization, the initiative where our funding is entirely on the membership subscriptions of something like 60 or 70 of the country's top corporates. And there's one or two cigarette companies in there. So mm -hmm. as disclosures, if people want to get mad about that, they can say that I'm bought out by big tobacco or something. But this is just my honest read of the literature, having paid attention to this stuff for rather some time. It's just facts, isn't it? It's just evidence. And in that's what seems to be missing from a lot of the discussions around all this. There's no evidence. You know, there's you you hear someone says, well, okay, well, what about Korea? What about Japan? Where they've got no vaping because it's against the law to have um, artificial nicotine. Yeah. Uh, you can only have nicotine in a product that's growing, so that means vaping is completely out in Japan and Korea. But the law says that you could have heated tobacco. Yeah. And they've had a more than 50% drop in people smoking in three years. And it, the health benefits for that are enormous. But we're told by these health advocates that, oh, well, that's Japan and that's Korea. It's completely different, you know, different culture, different. Well, actually, you know, hang on a second. Their culture is to have more smoking. So if you've yeah. taken a culture like Japan and Korea that is pro-tobacco smoking, it's pro-cigarette smoking, and had a massive impact on that, wouldn't that work better for us? <laughs> you know, that's well, what I'm looking at it like, and I'm thinking that seems simple. New Zealand has had dramatic successes in reducing uh, smoking rates, and that has be, that's been, it's been reducing over time smoking rates, particularly among youths, but the drop accelerated after access to vaping uh, became more normalized. So it became easier for people to switch to vape. And we can talk a little bit later about 
kind of how we got to that position because it's fun. Uh, and I think that the odd legal pathway that we got there is also important, uh, but we'll leave that to one side for now. The other kind of fun bit with the kind of campaigns against the differential excise, they're trying to have it both ways. So they're claiming that it's this like potentially hundreds of millions of dollars of giveaway to the company that makes heats. Now, that would only possibly happen if everybody who smokes flips over to heated tobacco, which would be a dramatic public health success, right? Mm -hmm. So to the extent that there's a big giveaway to whoever's, uh, I guess it's Philip Morris that makes heats, to the extent that they are paying less in excise because people have flipped from smoked tobacco into heated tobacco, that's a success for tobacco control and reducing the harms from smoking. Mm. So it only happens if you get a massive reduction in smoking rates. But they're also trying to claim that people wouldn't switch much from smoking to heated tobacco and that it is just a giveaway. Well, on current numbers, not that many people use heated tobacco. You'd yeah, have to have dramatic yeah, growth in it. So either they're figuring that a whole pile of non-smokers start taking it up, in which case the government isn't losing tobacco revenue, right? It's, it's an mm. increase in tobacco revenue or that you're having big flips over from smoked tobacco into heated, which is kind of the point of having that graduated excise regime, that you want excise to reflect the harms so that people can make appropriate choices given the prices that they're facing. Mm. Standard economics, isn't it? But but like, you know, I understand the number of people who use heated tobacco products in New Zealand is small, tiny. Yeah, it's yeah. Like 280,000 smokers in New Zealand. It used to be 750,000. Yeah. It's now 280, and there's about 7,000 around about that that are using heated tobacco products. Yeah, the numbers are pretty low, and it's partially that just the sequencing of how we've had reduced harm alternative come into the market here. So as you pointed out, in Japan, vaping wasn't legalized, but heated tobacco was, and so you've had a lot of shifts over to the far less harmful heated tobacco. If you look to the Scandinavian countries, there it's been snus. So that's a little pouch of powdered tobacco that gets put uh, between the lip and the gum. Mm -hmm. You kind, you don't quite suck on it, but it it it, it sits there. Oh. <laughs> so I I don't use the stuff except when I'm writing on tobacco, right? Just to remind, I I don't I'm not dependent on nicotine. I don't use nicotine, but when I'm writing on it, I like to remind myself that people enjoy this. And well, I, I write my columns faster when, when I'm when I've when I've got a, yeah, a snooze pouch pack and, in. And, I, and I'll disclose, I do use nicotine pouches because I can't smoke in my apartment building. I can't smoke cigars in my apartment, so I need to I yeah. will maintain my neuroplasticity, and I'll do whatever it takes to get hold of nicotine. And those uh, pouches, they give you quite a zing, you know. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you know about. It. Like, like I call it a cigar hangover, right? Because for for me, the pathology of nicotine is it plunges my blood sugars, right? So oh, so if I smoke a cigar and smoking a cigar you know, isn't like a cigarette, it takes you over an hour, even for a small one, to smoke a cigar. It's a, it's a form cigars of cigars are nice, and um, but after about fifteen twenty minutes, the nicotine's built up in your body. And that's why you get people who smoke cigars or ha don't smoke them very regularly, all of a sudden get a crash at about twenty minutes, and they say, "I can't, I can't have an, I can't suck another breath of of that in." And it's because their blood sugars have crashed, and huh. the, and and their body's telling them now stop doing this, right? But you can solve that problem when you're smoking cigars by having a coke or a beer or something that's got sugar in it, right? So I use them. Because a, it's healthier. You don't get cancer from nicotine, right? You don't. You get cancer from burning things and inhaling that. And so, I'm looking at all of this and thinking, why have we got this group of people there that are making a big fuss over a much less harmful product, or in the case of oral to um, nicotine pouches, like snooze, like like Zen, like the others? Why are they even protesting that and then saying? Oh, it's because they've got nicotine in them, and it's, oh, by the way, they're, they're sold by big tobacco. Those aren't rational yeah. reasons to keep taxing those products. 
Well, I suppose if I were to imagine myself as one of the University of Otago people and try and make the best argument that I could in favor of their position, it would be something along the lines of nicotine dependence is a bad into itself. We know that tobacco companies lied in the 1980s, so we have to be careful about trusting claims that, they've, that they're making now. That we know that increases in excise from 2010 onwards did help reduce smoking rates along with ongoing denormalization campaigns, ad bans, all of the other things that they were doing to change the social milieu around this. Um, that while vaping is good, it should not be the end game, that it should be in the fullness of time prohibited because of dependence issues, but for now it should be allowed as an alternative to smoking. That there are patches that people can use if vaping doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. We'll ignore that most people hate the patch. And the more reduced harm alternatives that are opened up, the more opportunities there are for people who wouldn't have been smokers and weren't going to take up smoking given the reductions in it to take up something that builds a dependence on nicotine. And that might have long term health consequences that we don't yet know about. So if I had to be, if I had to pretend to be an Otago person, that's how I would pretend to be an Otago person. Uh, I think that their argument fails on kind of a few lines. So one, youth uptake of vaping, it okay, partially is faddish, partially is displacing tobacco uptake that otherwise would have happened, but for the existence of less harmful alternatives. Use take more risks in general. There's periods where people try risky things and then they fall out of it. Uh, encouraging that such risk taking be with less harmful alternatives seems an awful lot better than with more harmful alternatives. And the experience out of Scandinavia and Japan points to that these different ways of getting nicotine are probably going to wind up being important for different cohorts. So we've had a lot of shifts into vaping from smoking and a, a few people who've taken up vaping that might not have otherwise smoked. There are a lot of people, for, though, who've not found vaping palatable for them. It just doesn't work for them compared to smoking. So they've kept with smoking. Continuing to try and hit that cohort with ever rising excise is a harm into itself, that it's a massive burden on disproportionately lower income households, because mm -hmm. that's the cohort that continues to smoke, and rising excise continues to build opportunities for building a black market. So just today, there was a conviction of a trio who brought in about half a million cigarettes. Um, Australia is having gang wars over this and fire bombings. It's entirely shifted to or very organized crime there. I'd be hesitant to try and keep pushing it on um, through price channels, through excise, and a lot. some of the Otago people have started being worried also about the effects of uh, continued excise increases. Increases in crime come as a result of that too. And and, yeah. and organized crime sees tobacco as an easier win for them rather than dealing in cannabis or any other uh, illegal substance. Well, sure. When excise is on the order of $1,600 a kilo, bringing it and the penalties, the ones that were just convicted for bringing in a half a million cigarettes with an estimated, I think it was $675,000 worth of excise foregone by the government, if those had been legal cigarettes otherwise, uh, they'd been in remand for a little over a year while they were waiting for a tri the trial to finish. Uh, so the, the sentence was time served plus an unspecified duration of home detention. It sounds like they're just waiting for uh, extradition to, or sorry, deportation to Thailand because they're Thai nationals that come here on short-term visas. Um, so they'll have a bit of home detention while they're waiting to be de deported. If smuggling like over half a million dollars worth of tobacco gets you deported at most, but smuggling uh, cocaine would probably have you in prison for a long time. Well, the one's going to be more attractive than the other, right? But also, that's not the first container load, or that's not the first. Load. Obviously. But this is a thing that annoys me about statistics. And you're an economist, so you live in the statistic world. I, I couldn't work out when I was at that tobacco control conference in Singapore. There was all this talk about sticks, sticks this, stick that, stick that. Yep. And they count a cigarette as an individual thing. So when customs makes this grand announcement that we've just arrested someone who has 
uh, you know, they've been illegally importing half a, half a million. Everyone goes, ooh, half a million. That's a huge number. Half a million. Divide by 20 to get packs, yeah. Divide by 20 to get packs, it's not, it's not that many when you think about it. And how many others came through? And then I'm starting to think, well, hang on a second. If it's worthwhile to do it and only about 7% of containers get checked, if you lose a container or two along the way and you've been a bit smarter about your invoicing and your, and your bills of lading, there's a yeah. possibility you could get away with maybe losing one container a month and still make millions of dollars. I think you could probably lose more than that, right? Because the amount of excise in a cigarette is huge, right? It's multiples of the cost of the tobacco and the manufacturing and everything else. So to the extent that you can sell it for any price that's close to, like, even if you're selling it at half the price of a legal cigarette, you're still doing okay. Mm. So have we reached peak excise then on tobacco from an economics point of view? There's a few ways of trying to think about it, one of which I certainly wouldn't have an answer on. I wish that there were good ways of having a handle on the size of the black market. What we do have are these discarded pack studies, and those are good in one sense, but they miss that a lot of smuggling shifted on customs accounts to loose tobacco, which would never be caught by discarded packs, like by definition, because they're not in cigarette containers. Mm. So for, for those who aren't familiar with it, the discarded pack studies, they go and pick up littered uh, cigarette packs or find them in trash cans and compare the package to packaging that is known to be legally sold in New Zealand. So they're looking for ones that either would have come in with a tourist as part of their duty free mm -hmm. or uh, that have been smuggled in. And during COVID, there wasn't that much of that because we didn't have tourists because the borders were closed. Mm -hmm. uh, but discarded packs, it gets you a rough handle on, on time trends if you ignore the period in which nobody's allowed to travel. We did have, I think it was in 22, 23, a big upswing in loose tobacco smuggling, which would never be caught by those discarded pack surveys. And if I'm remembering correctly, Otago had done a, its own discarded pack study and there had found is fairly low levels, but it was the same year that customs had found just this massive increase in loose tobacco smuggling. And you can find that in the customs annual report from last year. Then that then raises a question that if we don't know this totally, what the illegal situation yeah. is, and then you've got the Ministry of Health, uh, and, and they were kind of caught red handed here, right? So we're relying on the Ministry of Health to provide advice to the minister. Yeah. But we've got an email trail released under the Official Information Act that shows that they were zhushing up the stats, right? They were trying to make it sound, make an economic argument, right? Now, asking the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Health to make an economic argument, you know, these, these people aren't trained in that. But they were trying to make an economic uh, uh, argument in their advice to the minister that it would be cheaper for the government to retain the taxation on heated tobacco products and it would be more expensive to do what the government has done. And those emails yeah, show, that's weird. I mean, look, it's either cheaper or it isn't, right? But they were, they were egging each other on to package up some numbers to give to the minister and you would surely have to, as the minister, wonder whether you can trust their advice if they're, if they're doing this. I mean, these should be a black and white answer. It's either more expensive to do that or it's more expensive to do that. Well, I'd have to have the OA in front of me to be able to properly comment on it. Uh, I suppose that if you expected that most of the harms of smoking are locked in for long-term smokers, and if somebody flips at age 60, after like 30 years of smoking to heated tobacco, they've probably already locked in those harms. And if they stop paying excise, well, then the government gets less money. Maybe you could try constructing an argument that way. I thought that there were still, it was always still best advice to switch out of combusted tobacco, even if you had been smoking for 30 mm -hmm. years. Um, yeah, I would have to see the OA. That, that, that seems like an odd argument. Well, well, it's kind of the argument that they were making. Yeah. I, I wrote about it at the time. It was only a few months ago, you know, when they were seeking advice and there was all these emails saying we need to show that it's more expensive to 
to overturn this. And I'm sitting there thinking, hang on, is it, it's either more expensive or it's not. This is black or white. I think the Ministry of Health in general has been just really hurt over the change in tobacco policy with the change in government. So they had considered themselves as having gotten a pretty substantial win with Minister Varel's uh, tobacco control package. And Otago had been pretty happy with that set of policies as well. Uh, when that was rescinded, I think everybody on that side got a little, little, uh, a little bit nuts on it that they were very quick to reach for kind of almost conspiratorial stories of why it happened rather than the more obvious like act never liked the thing because uh like personal liberty grounds new zealand first was always skeptical about it but they were in coalition with labor before and national was kind of split on it and once it became obvious that the fiscal effects were substantial and they had a fiscal hole in when Winston wouldn't go for the foreign buyers tax, that um, the balance within national would have tipped on that. So the, the package mm -hmm. got repealed. But the package overall was a very bad idea. It, it, we'd we'd put, done some submissions on that and just looked at it at the time. Um, just for, for background, Minister Varel had a set of policies that would have mandated very low nicotine content in cigarettes that would have sharply reduced the number of outlets that were allowed to sell tobacco and that would have implemented a generation ban. So anyone that was born after 2009, if I'm recalling correctly, would never be able to legally purchase a cigarette. Uh, so in in the fullness of time, the age would go up from 18 to 19 to 20, so that there'd be a generation that would never catch up with the rising age limit. Leaving aside the rising age limit that would have started binding in uh, maybe five years time, again, I'm trying to remember now because I benchmark it where like my son would have been allowed to buy cigarettes. My daughter never would have been allowed to under those rules. So just when she would have turned 18, so I guess four years from now, the VLNC rules, it's unclear that there's anybody that actually could have supplied cigarettes to the New Zealand market that met that standard. So the thing probably was going to collapse or have led to a change in the regulatory allowance on nicotine. My, my bet, yeah. My understanding on the very low nicotine tobacco is that there is one company in the world that has a, such a tobacco. 21st century, yes. Right. Only one company. It's an American company. So it's an Amer even worse, it's an American tobacco company. And they actually paid for some public health advocates to go and study their very low tobacco um, product. And then those, unsurprisingly, those people came back and then pushed that into Asia Viral's inbox. And that's how we ended up with that. So the very well, public health advocates who yeah. cry about big tobacco have actually been benefiting from big tobacco. I, I don't know the who funded the studies on the uh, very low nicotine cigarettes. Um, We'd had a look. Uh, we, I can send you the link through later, so you can put it up on your site if you like. Uh, the submission that we'd done jointly with um, the Reason Foundation out of the U.S. on the VLNC rules, there were some problems in the VLNC studies that meant that you probably oughtn't extrapolate to what happens in a countrywide application of it, rather than a few limited trials. But folks can look through it there. We've got a fairly extensive detailing of those arguments. Yeah, I mean, it just seemed, it seemed crazy. And, and then there was this massive outcry when the incoming government said, well, these things aren't in place yeah. yet, so we're going to cancel yeah. those. We're yeah. almost at the smoke-free generation. And I was talking to Minister Costello earlier, and she was telling me that, you know, for the age group around 15 to, I think, 25, she mentioned, is uh, there's only 15,000 smokers in that group now. There used to be 115,000. Yeah. Um, they are technically under the 5% threshold, which is recognised worldwide as being a smoke-free generation. And they're the ones that you want to target. You don't want to get kids started on cigarettes early, right? You don't want them started on cigarettes at all. So if they're in in a smoke-free, using the technology, using the, the terminology, haven't we won the battle? Well, it, it looked like we were on track to be hitting that 5% regardless. And you could also look at the submission. I guess when we're when we're talking about the public health people, we probably need to um, differentiate that a little bit. So mm. 
it almost feels like there's war within the public health community on this issue. So you've got one set that view dependence itself as being a terrible harm and are very skeptical about harm reduction claims for reduced harm to alternatives. There's another group that are less worried about dependence per se because lots of things generate dependence like coffee uh, and that you feel bad if you haven't had it compared to if you have, but aren't inherently harmful in the same way. And shifting people into reduced harm alternatives that don't cause cancer for them is a lot more important. So it's been fun watching the uh, submissions from Action on Smoking and Health uh, Professor Beaglehole there has been very good. Um, ben Uden there has been good. They have been consistently putting up an approach that's grounded in harm reduction, trying to get people to flip to things that aren't going to kill them, and then wondering what, to what extent we ought to be considering low-scale dependence as a harm substantial enough to warrant these other measures that are being put in place. So they'd been less free. You wouldn't want to paint them as having supported the all of what National did when they came in, but they were a lot more realistic about that it wasn't going to affect progress to 2025's smoke-free goal, that the stats were on track anyway, and that what National had committed to in coalition on looking at legalizing SNUS. So like the packs that we both put up, we would have had to have gotten them out of mail order uh, mm. from abroad. I got I got mine on my last trip to North America just because I wanted to see what that was like, right? Yeah. Um, opening those up so that people have more pathways out of something that's really harmful can be good. And that's the, the argument that we're always told about excise tax. It's for your health, right? Well, it's you a fun one. Lots of tax. You, if you're smoking cigarettes, you've got lots of health, potential bad health outcomes, and they've quantified that as you know something like around about um, oh, I don't know what what are some numbers you've got on that? I think in two thousand and five, two thousand and six, they estimated oh, sure. three hundred and fifty million dollar health cost. So this gets back to the fiscal externality argument. So we'll leave to one side the let's help people for their own sake and make, make tax them into submission kind of argument. And let's just worry about the fiscal externality side. In 2008, uh, there was a study that was jointly commissioned by Action and Smoking and Health and the Smoke Free Coalition. Deso Day and George Thompson did the work on it. Uh, it's a little harder to, to get by Google now. I was able to get to, to get it, but it doesn't always turn up. Um, that one had concluded that as of the 2005-2006 fiscal year, uh, and it was coarse numbers, but they thought it, the, it was a big enough gap to, uh, well, you don't have to worry about the fine detail. To a first, first approximation, uh, smokers were covering their cost roughly two to three times over if you just considered the health cost or the excise versus the, the cost in the health system, and they hadn't there considered changes in superannuation. Now there's a really horrible, and you like you wouldn't want to advocate for it on this basis, but there's a horrible consistency in countries that have fairly generous superannuation or pe publicly funded pension systems and high tobacco excise in that Smoking kills people, they die early, and they don't take up pension benefits as much as people who live a longer time. Uh, that's not a good thing, and you wouldn't want to recommend that people start smoking so that they save the pension system money. But to the extent that you want to worry about the fiscal consequences of smokers, even if you leave that out, the research commissioned by Action on Smoking and Health and Smoke Free Coalition prior to the decade of 10% a year tobacco in excise increases that the John Key government brought in in coalition with Tariana Turia and the Maori Party. Even before that, smokers were paying their way substantially to something on the order of $350 million in health costs with something on the order of $980 million in excise at the time. Smokers were already paying their way. Then there's the added fiscal benefits through superannuation payments that just aren't made because people die early. So the, the government at the time had put out these numbers claiming that uh, smokers cost the money rather than saving the money. And I, I did some OIAing on it. The numbers never should have gotten to the minister because the numbers were wrong. 
Uh, it looked like some guy had taken an Excel sheet home for the weekend and played with it a bit and came to some pretty wrong numbers that didn't go through peer review, but got to the minister and the minister publicized them before anybody could check it. So what they'd done there was put people into all of these different age demographic sort of buckets. So you could say that like a 25 year old Pakeha smoker, they, they cost the health system this much on average and a 25 year old Pakeha non-smoker costs this much, take the difference, do that across all age buckets, add that difference up, and then you got a cost of smoking. Now, it sounds right in principle until you think about it for a minute, and you remember that smokers die an awful lot earlier than non-smokers. So comparing a 65-year-old smoker to a 65-year-old non-smoker is the wrong comparison. You want it, Basically, smoking brings forward a whole pile of end-of-life costs. So people mm. always cost the health system an arm and a leg in their last 10 years. Or maybe yep. the last couple of years, they're really, really expensive, right? Because you're you're in the process of dying. Dying is expensive for the health system, unless you, like my grandfather, just keel over suddenly of a heart attack unexpectedly and have never never encountered the health system. Okay. There's that cohort, and then there's the ones that incur an awful lot of end-of-life costs. Yep. If you're bringing forward end-of-life costs. You need to adjust for that. So what the Ministry of Health's numbers effectively did was assume that smokers would never have died if they hadn't been a smoker. <laughs> and I, I think people in the ministry finally under, understood that they botched that, but the minister had kind of run away with it. So that was a bit of a problem. Anyways, it's fairly common to find in this lit that smokers save the government money if they are paying a lot in excise and if there's a superannuation system. I mean, this is a thing I used to tease Winston about. You know, I just say to him about the gold card, mate, you've you've looked after the wrong people. And he says, oh, no, people, smokers, are, not smokers, old people have worked hard all their life and, you know, they deserve a break. I said, yeah, but let's look at, say, women, for example. And this isn't sexist. It's just a simple fact. Women work less than men on average over their lifetime. They, they take time out for families. There's all number yeah, of At least in paid employment, yeah, and pay less in tax. Yes. Yeah, pay less in tax. But they get the same benefits as some bloke who's worked his entire life and worked himself to the bone. And I said, but look at smokers. They've paid more tax voluntarily than anybody else, and they get no benefits because they die before they can collect their superannuation. And, and he'll sit, he'll just grin at me and go, oh, you know, I don't think I can sell that. <laughs> you know, but, It's probably right. But on economics, it makes sense because they have contributed, as you've said, three times. Three times the cost they've contributed in taxation. Yeah. So, if in fairness to the O'Day report, so they looked at a much broader set of costs. So they were including things like productivity costs because smokers, if they are going out of the building five times a day to have a cigarette, they're less productive than others. Now that does flow through into wages. It's not really a uh, you wouldn't call it an externality, uh, but. Lower productivity and less lower wages means that you, you're paying less in income tax than you otherwise might. Arguments around that can be a bit fraught because you, you could wind up cornering yourself. Like if you want to take that to its logical conclusion, somebody who takes an extra couple of weeks of unpaid leave as holiday because they really need a break. Well, they shouldn't be allowed to do that because of the cost of the government and in reduced income tax revenue. Uh, I don't like that kind of argument. It, it, it can can run that way. Uh, but they would have said that a broader set of costs is larger than the benefits of smoking, including the tax, which is just a transfer. If we are only caring about the cost of the government, though, yeah, pretty pretty obvious that the net fiscal effect is positive. We've pretty much delved into the numbers here, right? The numbers. Well, there's um, one other number. One other set of numbers that's kind of fun. So if we're looking at the effects on excise, mm. um, the Otago Public Health folks had run some numbers on what they thought would be the relevant elasticity. So the elasticity for an economist is what's the percent change in something given a percent change in something else. So yep. they were trying to figure out the effects of Nationals' decade of tobacco tax increases. So they'll yep. have two effects, economists to talk about the extensive and intensive margins. You'll have some people that quit smoking entirely, some people who smoke less. If we take the Otago Public Health people's numbers just for, for granted and say that they're correct about it, uh, Maori smoking rates were particularly of concern because of the, it's a much higher smoking rate than for Pakeha. Uh, mm -hmm. On those numbers, because of the tobacco excise increases, for every 1,000 Māori, you would have had 773 who were never smokers anyway, so it wouldn't be affected. 
13 who quit because of the tax increases and we'll assume that they get benefits out of that, that they enjoy health benefits. Um, and you had 214 who would keep smoking at a slightly lower rate and they would wind up paying about $1,000 more a year in excise as consequence. Now, where smoking is disproportionately low income, that that burns, right? So yeah. it it's a substantial effect on household budgets. If you look occasionally in the Stats New Zealand household living cost increase updates, they would point to tobacco excise being one of the larger contributing factors for uh, cost of living increases facing beneficiaries and low income households because it's a more predominant part of consumption bundles in those courts. Like it varies year to year and what, what else is coming up in those, but it has featured in these. You start weighing these harms and I really prefer measures that open up less harmful ways of accessing nicotine to measures that continue punishing low-income households for continuing to smoke. Well, that raises an interesting point there, and it's probably not your your wheelhouse being an economist, but you can understand the uh, effect of advertising. Like if you take, I remember you didn't used to be able to advertise alcohol on television, and then somewhere in the past they decided to release to allow you know, alcohol advertising, and we had you know the famous DB draft ads with the with the horses trotting along, you know, yeah. and beer and all of those. You know, things at the same time that we did that, we banned advertising of cigarette products because because they're harmful, right? And, and and I couldn't really work that out. But then when you look at the low uptake of heated tobacco products in New Zealand, and you start to dig into why that is, where you end up or where I've ended up is that <laughs> the manufacturers of these products, which produce a substantially less harmful product are actually not allowed to advertise their product. And so it's almost a secret that there are alternative pathways uh, for smokers to contain, you know, there's all the social aspects of it and, and hand movements and, you know, um, yeah. ma- you know, mouth to, to, to cigarette, all the rest of that sort of thing, that uh, habitual you know, habit forming. Yep. Those things remain, um, but they're using a much less harmful product, but we're not allowed to tell anybody about that. And, in fact, it's even worse than that, as the minister said to me earlier. The retailers, you know, can't say to someone who's come into their store, you know, maybe you'd like to try this, it's less harmful. They're not even allowed to say that to people. Yeah. He's utterly crazy in my mind that – now, if I'm remembering right, I think even the FDA has allowed heated tobacco in the U.S. to say that people using it will have less exposure to the harmful chemicals that come from uh, smoke tobacco. They're, I don't think that they're allowed to say that you get lo- better long-term health outcomes because that hasn't really been shown yet because long-term isn't there. But I think that they are able to say that it has less exposure to the toxic constituents hmm. that you um, find in tobacco smoke. So it would be nice if people were able to put up the, the things that are validated by the science on it. Uh, at the, so I expect that you're right that that would be part of it. I would expect also, though, that it's been the rapid uptake of vaping here that has meant there's been less space for uh, reduced harm alternative. Like, well, they're not allowed to advertise vaping either. Right? That, that's the thing. The vaping products aren't allowed to be advertised either. Yeah, the whole progression towards legalization on vape is an awful lot of fun for New Zealand. So here, I think that we did well because we started off with an almost illicit market that embedded itself before the rules got set. So here, if we think back a few years, uh, National had been talking about legalizing vaping and nobody had come up with a reg framework for it yet. And National had a member's bill that they were starting to think about building a regulatory framework Meanwhile, in the background, quietly, people were starting to get access to vape and a community was developing. Okay, So you had a lot of people who were vapers by the time the government came around to setting a regulatory regime around it. It is easy to set a very restrictive and prohibitionist regime on something that few people are accessing and using. 
it's harder to set a very restrictive prohibitive one around something that's got a, a well-established user base. So because a lot of people had successfully stopped smoking because of vaping, by the time the government came to setting rules, and in part, this was facilitated by the, the court ruling. It's a court ruling around heats. So if you remember this one, it is Ministry of Health versus PMI, uh, where the government had always held that vaping was illegal because they were claiming that the nicotine of it in it couldn't be proven to not be from tobacco. And any tobacco that was not a cigarette was prohibited under the Smoke-Free Environments Act. So this was the Ministry of Health position circa 2016. Uh, so you only really had gray market vape at that that, that point because the Ministry of Health viewed it as being illegal, but they wanted it to be legal because there were some sane people there. Yet this court decision in PMI that said that the restriction in the Smoke-Free Environments Act where you had the comma or other oral use so you had a line in it that banned chewing tobacco, comma, or tobacco for other oral use. The judge said in that ruling that the standard legal way of reading these things is that it's restrictive, that it has to be substantially similar to chewed tobacco. It couldn't be something that's entirely different from chewing. And there's nothing in heated tobacco that's like chewing. You're puffing on a, on a heated tobacco stick. The same is also true for vape, and the same is also true for snooze. You don't chew those. The oral exactly just fit in between your lip and the in the top. Yeah. Fifteen minutes later, you have a headache. Exactly. So the ministry's position was legally untenable. So then vaping really picks up because it is obviously not illegal, mm -hmm. and they finally then get a regulatory framework around it, which is pretty reasonable. And the ministry, which had been asserting that snus was illegal, finally put a change to the Smoke Free Environments Act saying, OK, no, actually, snus is definitely illegal. We're going to sp specifically prohibit it, where previously we've just pretended that it's prohibited. Uh, I guess one final bit that I might want to get into on vape. I've just I've been disappointed in minister, or I guess, in the government on this one, where they're they've been concerned about youth uptake of vaping and. They've been trying to hit this through two channels. One, increased enforcement on retail, which is fine. Like, you don't want retailers selling to under 18s. And if they want to do more enforcement on that, great. The other way that kids get smoking, uh, get, get vape, is through social supply, through through friends and, and older siblings. Parents. And instead of doing a sensible thing, they are trying to ban uh, disposables. And disposables are useful for especially elderly people who can't fill a vape tank. Uh, there are cohorts that will have difficulty with the ban that they're putting in. And these are people who had shifted away from smoking. If the government really were con concerned about youth vape, they should probably be hitting social supply. And we've got a framework for that. So if you look in the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act, it is illegal for an adult to supply a minor with alcohol unless they have the parent's permission. Mm. So a parent can give alcohol to their child. Yep. A the publican or someone else can if they've got permission from the parents and that's like a reasonable framework for vape too because you would want it to be legal like if your kid if my kids started smoking i would want to give them vape so that they weren't smoking anymore right yeah parental supply that way should be allowed supply with parental permission could also be similarly allowed and otherwise penalize social supply like that's the first thing you should be doing if you're worried about youth uptake and instead they're doing this other stuff I mean, I don't get it because if you make something illegal like vapes, like cigarettes for under 18s, they want it. You know, drinking is illegal for under 18s, but they, drew, they, they still get alcohol, they still get cigarettes, they still smoke cannabis. Just because you've got a law doesn't stop people doing it. And, you know, you'll probably agree with me here in – that prohibition's never worked anywhere. Now, I've got a mate who says to me, no, nah, Cam, every time he hears me say that on the radio, he, he texts me, he says, you're still wrong, Cam. Prohibition has been successful in only one country that he's aware of. I said, what's that? And he said, China, where um, they just lined up all the opium dealers and executed them, <laughs> right? But no, we're not prepared to do yeah. that. <laughs> that's, how they, I, that's how prohibition on opium worked in China. That's how they did it. Uh, and alcohol prohibition in the U.S. did reduce uh, drinking. It had an awful lot of other bad consequences, but it did reduce uh, drinking. Like you could see it in alcohol-related liver cirrhosis. There have been studies looking at the reduction in that with U.S. prohibition. But 
<laughs> there are all kinds of other bad things that come with it that you probably don't want. Yeah, the mafia, bootlegging, yeah. uh, uh, products that are actually infinitely more harmful, you know, with, with um, things made with methanol, for example, rather yeah. than ethanol. Right, but one letter makes a lot of difference. <laughs> one one will kill you, the yeah. other might. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. a whole lot of things that come from that. And so this is why I'm I'm really exercised about finding out. Let this remove the emotion from all of this. Just deal with the facts, right? And where I'm looking at it from, we're a world leader in smoking rates. Right, well, there's a lot to celebrate about what we're doing. Yeah. What we hear, seem to hear is all this negativity. And I'm trying to work it. Hang on a second. If we were getting the spectacular results in education that we're getting in stopping people smoking, you would have the teacher unions mm. on desks, you know, say, yeah, everything we're doing is working. But what we seem to have here is a, a whole bunch of people that have moved from smoking cessation to wanting to make sure nicotine is nowhere in the country without actually realising that well, nicotine is not actually harmful, that harmful. It's addictive, yes. We all agree on that. But it doesn't kill you. And yeah. that seems to me to be illogical because their arguments are designed to actually keep tobacco products in New Zealand rather than wean people off tobacco products, which I would have thought would have been their goal. And I struggle with this. I really do. I think that they had taken Varel's reform as being a world-leading victory in their version of tobacco control. Mm. So we were doing things that nobody else had done yet or was likely to do. It looks like the UK is picking up some of what Varel had promised. Uh, and that one seemed to be my bipartisan consensus there, that the Tories were pushing it and the uh, Labour looks like they're going to continue with it. But nobody else was doing this. They liked that version of things. And... If you have worked your whole life in that area towards that kind of goal, and then it flips by surprise in a coalition agreement when it hadn't really been campaigned on, and there I think that it, there, it wasn't that these guys were bought out by the tobacco industry. It was that well, it just act, the act and National were opposed to it to start with, and or sorry, Act and New Zealand First were opposed to it to start with, and New Zealand and and National were a bit split and then saw the fiscal consequences of mm -hmm. telling anybody who smokes that they're going to have to go to the black market if they want to get a cigarette. Yeah, I mean, ACT come, is coming at it from a purely libertarian point of view, right? Yeah. No, no one in New Zealand now is under any illusion that smoking cigarettes is incredibly harmful for you and likely to end in your death in a horrible way. That's not pleasant. Well, they They've been called coffin nails for, for 100 years, right? We've had so much education about it that we're at the point now where, and this is why I look on excise tax on tobacco, I call it a stupid tax. Right? Yeah. That, it, 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 it's a bit mean, right? But if but people have choices to make and you can stop smoking, it's difficult. Although, again, I facetiously say, look, it can't be that hard to stop. I know people have stopped hundreds of times. <laughs> right. Well, it's but, easier to stop when you open up more options and let people find what works for them. And that's what makes me nervous about bans on specific flavorings and on opposing opening up. Yeah, that flavoring argument, channels. Right? that's nonsensical as well. Because the which you, one? The, the flavoring argument. Oh, yeah. So, so this is how it goes from usually from the University of Otago. They say, oh, no, we, can't, we, we have to ban flavored vapes because that makes vapes a gateway into cigarette smoking because of the flavors. They get used to the the flavors like bubble gum or or you know, I don't know, unicorn sprinkles or whatever the flavor is, right? It's not tobacco, it's not smoke. And then once they're hooked because of the evil nicotine, they'll then transfer to smoking cigarettes. Right. Well that doesn't make sense. Right? If you've got something that tastes nice, why would you go to something that tastes awful? No, no human on earth would do that except these morons who are saying that's their argument on flavoring. I guess the only way that you okay, suppose that I, I'm trying, I always try and see what like try and steal man an argument, right? So, what's, what's the yeah. most defensible form of it? So, on that one, um, suppose that the government followed some of these 
bits of advice around restricting the maximum nicotine concentration in vape so that you prevented uh, like high intensity smokers from being able to successfully shift into vaping because they can't get the same hit. If you pushed that allowable level down far enough, you could imagine people flipping from low nicotine vape to yes. something. If, if they start wanting wanting higher intensity, and the only way to get that is in in tobacco or in, in smoked tobacco, I don't know why you'd want to set policy that way. And I'm not, I've not seen evidence that people want to ramp up the intensity of concentration. Usually, at least with people quitting smoking, it goes the other way that you start off high concentration and ease your way down. Um, Maybe you could try and make an argument that way. It's it seems ludicrous though. The more sensible arguments around flavorings have been around that it is very difficult to predict the what happens chemically when you heat these weird mixes of constituents that make the flavors. So uh, all of these flavors are these weird mixes of chemicals that behave. It's, well, you aerosolize them at high temperature. Maybe something weird happens and you can't quite tell for all of these different flavoring mixes. And I had thought that New Zealand had come to a fairly reasonable regulatory solution on that one. So the New Zealand rules are that it's a rather than seeking pre-approval for each product formulation, you're instead having product notification. So the manufacturer has to report to the Ministry of Health, here are all of the things that are in our flavorings. So that if somebody starts reporting a bunch of like weird effects from a combination of these chemicals that go into making the flavorings, then they can just check down the list and say, okay, well, that means this flavor, this flavor, this flavor, and this flavor, we'll get them withdrawn from the market. Mm. So that seems kind of reasonable where it's probably impossible to do the tests on all the different permutations that you might have without really tying up the market. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, again, it seems to be one of these emotive arguments that doesn't have any empirical evidence to support it. And that's what I think we're seeing increasingly, emotional arguments, uh, moral panic type yeah. arguments. Well, sure. To justify increases in taxation or restrictive um, policies for products that are actually less harm. I mean, just on the FDA, for example, they've had multiple studies that have shown, and these are FDA released and approved studies that show that smoking one to two cigars a day has a negligible negative health oh. effect on you, right? And yet we've got a tobacco tax regime that says that smoking cigars and pipe tobacco is only you know twenty percent, twenty percent worse. And now, if you're going to smoke, you know, ten cigars a day, well, you've got a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> Right? Yeah, it's about ten hours of smoking. It's probably a bit weird that cigarillos are in the same category as cigars because they seem an awful lot closer to a cigarette. But no, because cigarillos, the wrapper is tobacco, yeah. and and inside the the wrapper um, is just tobacco. There's no additives in cigarillos, so that that's the that's the differential, right? So cig cigars and cigarillos have no additives. The only component in each of those products is 100% tobacco. There's nothing else. I'm not up to speed on the studies look, differentiating between cigars and uh, cigarillos mm. and cigarettes. I have understood that the consumption patterns associated with cigars are far less harmful than the consumption patterns associated with cigarettes, but I, I, I'll plead ignorance that, on the numbers. That's, on most, that. that's mostly, I would think, to do with time. You know, a, a, a four-and-a-half-inch cigar with a decent ring gauge is an hour smoke, you know, uh, uh, a, um, you know, Winston Churchill level cigar, you know, big long cigar. You're looking at two and a half hours to smoke something like that. You just can't smoke them fast. Um, they don't burn particularly quickly either. They, they yeah. burn very slowly. If you actually leave a cigar on an ashtray, it'll go out. Yeah. A cigar on oh. a cigarette on an ashtray, it'll burn all the way to the filter and then, that's it. So when I was in grad school, I enjoyed cigars a little more often than I do now, partially because <laughs> it was in the U.S. and it was a low tax environment, but also because uh, my to-be wife had a, a second job where one of the bar, bar called Carpool in Arlington had a cigar bar attached to it, and she she manned the cigar bar a couple nights a week, and uh, another friend of mine from grad school manned the cigar bar also. So spend a bit of time there. Yeah. 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 
but but overall though, you know, just just we've gone in and out of excise tax and very dry economics, and I, and I actually think that when it comes to these sorts of policies, an economist is a better policy person than someone who's using emotional triggers to to get what they want. Um, but overall though, we're actually doing well as a country for stopping people smoking. And I hope that we don't backslide on it with the coming restrictions on vaping. Well, I mean, I guess people can, all they can do is lobby MPs about it. Um, they've got to care enough, but you know, we know what happens uh, when, as soon as you start lobbying on things, you get labels and then you get people attacking you. And so people don't do it. So well, I'd expect that it, it- it would have to come from the vaping community themselves. If you're a vapor and you depend on disposable and cartridge-based systems that are going to be prohibited, you should probably check into that. And, well, I don't use either. If it's a big nothing burger and it'd be easy to shift over to tanks, then you could probably let the select committee know about that. But if it isn't, then you probably want to let the select committee know about that too. Yeah. So as a, a final sort of comment after all of this discussion around tobacco controls and things like that. Where do you think, what do you think we're doing right? And what do you think we need to avoid? Well, we've done very right in setting a liberal regime around vaping. And I think that we lucked into that, that we happened to have a an established community of vapors before the regulatory regime was established, which meant that the views of those who, de- who rely on vaping as a way of staying off cigarettes were able to be incorporated into the legislative framework. So we, we had a happy confluence where we had some sensible people in the Ministry of Health. We had an active user base that was able to say, this affects me, so people wouldn't start from a presumption of prohibition, but instead start from a presumption of wanting to have safe legal markets for something that has been pretty helpful. So that's good. Um, I think that we are also doing well in having avoided a lot of what had been proposed by the last Labour government and rescinding those because they would have fueled a black market. Uh, Also in opening up the looking at snus, uh, that's also very good so that people have more of these options. I worry on you're right on the moral panic aspects that can lead to poor policy. In the US, uh, there's kind of a surge in youth vaping that's then come back since. It'll be neat to see what happens in the New Zealand data. There has been a surge. How much of that is self-reversing? We'll find out as a bit, whether it's a faddish thing. To the extent that government wants to worry about it, they should be looking at social supply rather than at um, well, what they're doing now on disposables, which will have broader consequence than just the cohort they're trying to target. Um, so hopefully we're able to avoid moral panics. It's been disappointing watching some of the media fueling of those. Uh, if you'll recall, I think it was circa 2018, there was um, what they were calling e in the US. So it was obvious really early that you had some contaminated THC vapes where people were using vitamin E acetate as yeah. a thickening agent. So think make people think that there was more THC in it and that that was driving like a whole pile of very severe uh, health consequences. Like Radio New Zealand here was portraying it as being like vaping rather than, which everyone would understand as nicotine, rather than being illicit black market THC vapes that were adulterated. Um, Mm. So that's not helpful. And it's resulted in studies in the U.S. showing a lot of people not understanding that vaping is a lot safer than cigarette smoking because of some of the fear monitoring around vape. I hope that we can avoid that Mm -hmm. Uh, to the extent that we've got a larger user base. It's easier to avoid it, but yeah. Well, it's been a really fascinating discussion and um, I'm glad you've come on the show because uh, we need to cut through a lot of the emotional stuff and start looking at policy solutions that are sensible, that are actually enforceable as well. Because when you get a policy situation that's not enforceable, then it, then all it is is virtue signaling as law, and that's not what laws are yeah. for. Right? Um, and we want to avoid that. We none of us. I mean, I'm a cigar smoker, and, and I smoke pipes occasionally, but I don't. I'd never smoke cigarettes, and I don't want other people to smoke cigarettes. Yeah. You know, it's it's they're awful things. Whereas cigars, well, you know, I, I just need large amounts of nicotine just to keep my brain, uh, yeah. you know, working. And I've got a health reason for it. But, um, yeah, I think we need to have sensible public policy where we haven't got two groups of people screaming at each other with nonsensical 
unable to be based by evidence sort of policy positions. And and to talk to you who, I mean, you're a policy wonk. That's what you do for a job, right? You look at policy and, and assess that from an economics point of view. I think that's a very valuable thing that we need to be injecting into this discussion. Oh, thank you, Cameron. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Thanks for coming on The Crunch. As you can see, it pays to be in command of the facts when you take on Eric Crampton. He's like us. Those of us here at Reality Check Radio and all you listeners, he deals with reality, not hopium. And he has the skills, credentials and facts and figures to back up his opinions. And we'll strive to get the public health advocates on the show so they can explain their position. We've invited them, but so far they have declined, but we won't give up trying. We need more debate, not less. Tell me what you think of my discussion with Eric Crampton. Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.